welcome you all back to Think Take a Wise Human Humane Architecture, still in the claws of COVID-19, and we're increasingly and continuously looking into COVID curing or at least combating compatible courtyards. And for that, we've been out and about in Germany and on the West Coast, and now we're slowly but surely heading back home to Hawaii to where we can hear it's very tropical exotic we hear birds and pretty soon we can see your dog the soto hi the soto hi hello martin and yes i'm here <laughs> all right so let's jump right in and get the first up here which is um you know we shouldn't be unfair there's actually uh, several homes especially from mid-century that are employing courtyards uh many or several of them are actually by the architect of your childhood, the house you're sitting in by Vladimir Asipov. Yes. We choose this one here where, and you have just said, sometimes in the future, we maybe us as Dokomomo are gonna get the chance to see your house, which, which would be nice. Yes, yes. And Dokomomo actually took a chance to seeing here on the first slide, which is uh, our host was an organization that's um, basically, um, restoring historical fish ponds on the way out to Hawaii Kai. And the gentleman you see at the very top in the middle picture was the community leader. And that way they got also um, taking care of the house uh, here that we see. That was Walter Lamb's house. And Asipov was, as we hear, you know, part of the uh, creating team. And the house, uh, you can, you won't, you know, really, um, realize it that much when you're out on the busy uh, highway there out of Waikai, but it's right fronting the street and right behind the wall is the first entrance courtyard. And when you go through the house, you end up immediately in a backyard courtyard with lots of open lanai. So it's, it's really kind of an ultimate easy breezy courtyard lanai example. And you DeSoto, who have once again very rather personal access to him, explain to us who Walter Lamb was. Well, Walter Lamb was a person who became famous for designing and using and creating outdoor furniture. And he had, there's a very interesting story as to how that furniture was created. We see in this slide here some examples of the Walter Lamb furniture, but let's go to the next slide. And this one, we, sh we can see details of a Walter Lamb chair. And this chair is made from copper piping. It's copper pipe. And Walter Lamb got started right after World War II when there was a lot of military surplus material left over in the Hawaiian Islands because a lot of Army and Navy personnel were here. They had to build buildings for them. And then they all left when the war ended. So here was this, here was this uh, extra pipe. He bought the copper piping and he used that to start his furniture, his outdoor furniture company. And you can see in these pictures, which is an example of one of the Walter Lamb chairs, there are the pipes that have been welded together to create the framework of this chair. And I might point out, this chair actually was used at the Holly Kulani Hotel. And my mother and I bought it when the Holly Kulani shut down in 1981. And that's when our friend Ron Lindgren built, you know, designed the whole new Holly Kulani Hotel. So here's our inspiration for what we're going to lead into for the rest of our show. And we can go to the next slide. And this is a presentation that I did for a visiting German merchants group um, that we can talk about more later if we want to. But this is about the history of innovation here in the Hawaiian Islands. And I don't think people realize how much stuff was innovated here. In the upper left corner, here is a drawing by King Kalakaua from the 1870s or 1880s about um, a torpedo he wanted to create that would look like a fish. Um, other things in here include the Ala Moana building with its exterior louvers that could move, as well as the rotating restaurant on the top, La Ronde. We also see some equipment that was created for the sugar industry, the sugar and pineapple industries innovated things. The first aluminum beer can was actually invented and used here in the Hawaiian Islands by Primo Beer. But the main picture here on the left in the center, on the right in the center, is shipping containers. 
the Pacific Ocean and the Matson Navigation Company were the first users of shipping containers in the Pacific after they were invented on in the US mainland. We were the first place to use them outside of the East Coast starting in 1958. And that is what we are gonna be focusing on for the rest of this particular show. That is shipping containers. All right, gets us the next slide. And talking in the sense of Walter Lamb, right, repurposing something that's sort of contemporarily abundant. Um, this is my, when I was still back in, in our hood from my Waikiki Grant Lanai, here's Doggy enjoying. And so I was actually looking at the cargo ships driving by. This is a picture I took from my Lanai. And I was thinking, how could one repurpose them for the, um, you know, increasing the urgent uh, use of dwelling? And we're laying out a grid of eight feet, which is the, the width of the container and also the length, because it's 40 feet that our weekly math here is five times, goes into that. So we were doing this checkerboard grid of eight feet. And then placing, suggesting to place containers in this sort of pinwheeling configuration. And let's go to the next slide and, and see how that would feel. And you, and, but before that, we were uh, using automobiles as vehicles for thought. And we've been pointing out uh, you guys' wine's uh, obsession with German VWs. And we did an entire show about that at the top right. This one here, tell me, do you remember which one that is? And what does it have to do with our topic today? Well, what we're talking about here is what was sold in the United States as the Volkswagen thing it was actually developed, as you pointed out, for nefarious evil purposes for the use of the Nazi army. And it was a, intended to be an amphibious vehicle. And fortunately, as time passed and it was put back into production and sold for civilians starting in the 1970s and 80s, um, again, as I said, in the USA, it was referred to as the thing, the Volkswagen thing it became kind of a fun vehicle for people to rent. It became something that was uh, associated with vacations and warm climates. And as you also said in the film, 51st Dates, Drew Barrymore has one of those and drives it around here on the island of Oahu. And the thing was meant to be initially totally utilitarian for military use. When it was repurposed and sold to civilians, it was meant to be, as I said, fun, but also useful. You could fold down the roof, you could fold down the windshield, you could be in totally in the open air. But something else that I think is interesting is the body of the car to strengthen the sheet metal is corrugated. And when that was done originally for the military, because the German army used it later on too, after the Nazi period, it was just to strengthen it to make it useful. But the corrugations are something which you can clearly see, but we're going to see that also in the focus of this show, which is shipping containers. They are corrugated as well. Yeah, so next slide is what came out of this inspiration is to basically do something to totally flip 180 degrees the meaning, I mean, shipping containers don't have a good connotation either. I mean, we ship all that stuff we need in them, but you know, they're not like the things we find pretty, right? So same with a car that Hitler invented and then the hippies basically adopted. Uh, here in the same intention and also the Walter Lamp methodology, how can you repurpose shipping containers to make beautiful Hawaii in place as we're illustrating here. So let's go to the next slide um, because something is key to, um, we're gonna have a show, a shipping container project here in one of the shows in Germany where it's getting chilly now. So you need to prevent them to get cold. In Hawaii, not so much. It's about protecting them from getting overheated, right? It, because metal is a conductor. So here, when I first landed on the island, I was charged to go to a BIA show in the, I think in the uh, Blaisdell Convention that they're gonna tragically re renovate in a way we're not most fans of. 
and there was this basically ocean of ugliness of all these vendors trying to sell stuff that you really don't need. And then there was this island of hope of meaningfulness, which were these two guys that you can see there, Eric and Brandon from EcoShade, and they are basically promoting and selling this very exotic, uh, based in their native Australia, roof system out of uh, just like the Alamoana previous, you know, enclosure, which they unfortunately took away. But here horizontally, these aluminum louvers on tracks that can open and close. So we were suggesting to basically make this canopy out of eco shade hovering over uh, the entire uh, house. Go to the next slide. And so talking utilitarian DeSoto by spacing them out on this checkerboard grid of, of eight feet, the container doors that you don't need anymore if you're doing another screen infill instead could then basically become the quadrant doors. So when you're thinking you're like the new farmer and this is your country courtyard cabana farmhouse and you're coming from your day of farming you're basically seeing the containers closed and then we're cutting out the three fifth in the middle of it, which is where uh, fittingly the, the medicine signage sits. And then we put what we cut out back on sliding track. Yeah, so those would be on sliding tracks and what you would be then doing would be, you, you open up the space and this is something that we just were talking about, uh, Martin and I, before the show, how these can be used in different manners. And let's go to the next slide. Oh, Martin is back. So let's get Martin to continue yeah. to talk about this. There we are. Yeah. Okay, so that's the condition, thanks for bridging, uh, that we then get is when you have it slide, it basically the only thing left is the corners of eight by eight feet that uh, depending on how you want to go resilience wise in the storm you can yeah so back to me the purpose of this is you can open this space up and you've got two two options if the if in the case of a hurricane and yes we do have hurricanes here that is a consideration you can either shut the thing up completely and try to be as uh, protected as possible. And of course, the shipping container is a very robust exterior, so that would possibly protect you. Or you can leave it open for the wind to go through to then be more safe in that respect because you're not going to get pushed over. And you can take refuge in the parts of the uh, container which are still closed off. And that's the way that that could work. And again, overhead, you see we've got this canopy of the rotating or the maneuverable aluminum uh, fins that could either shade it or be opened up as you wish. Okay, go to the next slide. And let's see if Martin is here to talk about that. Well, I'll, I'll just keep going. On the right is a magazine ad for the Volkswagen thing. And this is hearkening back to what I just said earlier. The text of this ad points out how useful the thing was because you can shut the, you can close it up, you can open it up completely. Because the top is open, you can carry big, tall things. And basically, you're, it's, it's a box, it's a corrugated box like a shipping container, except it's on wheels and you can move it around. In the picture on the left, we see how, again, this reconfigured shipping container might be used in a habitat in which it is inhabited and you create enclosed spaces. And that's the point that we've been talking about in previous shows, courtyards, enclosed spaces, which are open to the sky, which are useful not only because they're nice to live in, but here now in the age of COVID-19, they are physically safer for us because you have a moving air that keeps the virus from hanging around too much. And let's see if Martin can rejoin us and we'll go to the next slide. All right. Can you guys hear me again? Yes, your, your function. Okay, good, good. Thanks, DeSoto. And so here, uh, one of the fans of the projects endorsing it was our friend Kaili Chun, who I consider to be the best Hawaii and Hawaiian artist uh, on, on the islands. And she basically said, Martin, you know, this is pretty much along the lines of how my ancestors have been living. You know, each different function of life had a different holly and they were assembled around and they created what you can call a courtyard in the middle. 
And since we cannot latch and thatch anymore for various reasons for the demand we're having, the shipping containers might be our most abundant local building material. And so she said, you know, one of these days I want to build one of them on my family property on the big island. So we would look forward to that. But above and beyond, next slide is uh, we have to house ten thousands of people, as we were pointing out in the last show with with Ron, where we were observing the Eichler phenomenon, who had built eleven thousand homes uh, overall, uh, over the entire California. So here we were proposing to make little communities out of them, where these courtyard houses would then also gravitate around the communal courtyard. So the courtyard theme repeating and reoccurring. Next slide. Um, we, again, uh, this is then up and now and, and now is down there. And it's literally and figuratively down because when I first saw that, what DHHL is doing, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, who uh, had reached out to us, and this is a next project that was actually before the previously shown project, I was rather shocked because I thought this has little to nothing to do with the way one used to live in, in balance with the elements in Hawaii. This is an invasive American track home uh, assembly. And what we see as is not a courtyard, but it's almost like a prison yard, right? Does it mm -hmm. look like that? Yeah. So how can you improve that? The next slide. So when I first came, I was approached by my school and my dean at that time, Clark Llewellyn, if I would like to take on a project that DHHL had initiated together with the Building Industry Association, which would be to rethink the way uh, DHHL is building for their local people. And we drove out and visited this rather charming, smaller community out west in, in Waianae. But how, how does that come across uh, to you, DeSoto, what you see? Well, the, the picture in the upper right really, to me, we've got a lot of extra space that's used up in the ceiling area, which is not really of any great use at this particular moment in this configuration. It also, as you pointed out, is a hermetically sealed box. There is no visual access to the outside because the windows have curtains on them. And it's called, it's completely air conditioned. So you're spending money to air condition this big open space up above rather than being able to use it. And as you also said, when you're outside, you really, you have a beautiful view. You've got a fantastic view of the mountains, but you're not really able to make use of it just because of the way the house and the exterior backyard are configured. And it's kind of a lost opportunity. And Martin, okay, let's go to the next slide. And uh, I, these are these are drawings that Martin has created, and I'm sorry I can't see them very clearly in this particular moment to be able to give you more information. And Martin's not available right by, right now. But these drawings exhibit or show so looking oh, for you know a better opportunity. Yeah. Okay, Martin is, is cutting out on us again, but but we're we're hard to, again. This is a look back to how Hawaiians, ancient Hawaiians, set up the way that they lived, and they had compounds in which they had separate hale, which were used for separate purposes. And this is something that, rather than turning the interior of a, of a house into specific rooms, this is the way the Hawaiians no, did it. No, you go ahead. I still can't see where we are right now. So. Okay, poor Martin is is not able to join us. Martin, we've had technical problems. So let's go to the next slide. And here is the overall uh, configuration of the small development that the Department of Hawaiian Homelands created that Martin was a part of. And this is the overall you know, picture that you can see. And there's one little tiny yellow spot. And that was, the, that was the potential space that they could work with. What Martin did on the right was to show a, a progression of how the spaces could be used. At the very top, it's the way the space normally would be used in the American suburban development. And gradually it turns into a, a situation where you have more communal spaces and you have the negative spaces between the 
the structures as being common places which various people can use. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now, um, again, Martin is the person who really knows about this, so I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. In the open spaces here that we can see, we've got, first of all, a, um, a kind of an A-frame roof that is overhead over the open spaces. Those are potentially to be uh, constructed of the system which we just talked about, which is the eco-shading, where those louvers, which in this case are placed horizontally, can be opened or closed based on what the weather is and what your needs are. And I hope I'm saying this all right to you, Martin. Let's go to the next slide. And here again, um, I apologize. I can't clearly see what these are to be able to describe them. And I'm, I, I'm sorry that we're doing this uh, so makeshiftly. But these again are pencil drawings to show how, if you're talking about a series of shipping containers placed so that they have a communal space between them. They also have where the open space becomes something which is more used. Now, we talked about the Eichler homes as having courtyards, and this was something that we've been continually discussing in our series now. What we see here, however, different from the Eichler homes, the Eichler homes were private. These would be spaces which most of the tenants around them would use. So it isn't exactly comparable to what we talked about previously, but it is very similar. Next slide. Okay, again, um, one of the things that is in, in, in the courtyard cabana uh, setup, the kitchen remains a place where, again, because of the plumbing that you need to install, that's something that is very specific and you have to build that in. But the other spaces in these, in these uh, little compounds do not have to be as necessarily segregated or specifically tasked with just one thing. In other words, they are more useful for more than one purpose. And this is something that I said earlier about the ancient Hawaiian way of creating a living space. You didn't have rooms. Those hale did not have interior partitions for rooms. What they did have, however, was just one open space, but they also, there were separate structures for separate activities. So what we're saying here is not necessarily segregating a house into this is strictly a bedroom, this is strictly something else. You've got open spaces that are more useful for different things. Next slide. Okay, here is the overall view of how this might work. And what we've got here, again, are um, the separate spaces. One of the things that Martin pointed out was there's also a carport incorporated into these. And carports locally are the place where we do a lot of socializing. Because they are open spaces, because they, are, they don't have solid walls in most cases, that's where people have parties. That's where people have gatherings. It's very common to drive by a house with a carport and see that people are sitting outside in folding chairs or that they're having a party. And so here again, you see the two containers are placed so that there's the negative space between them. There is the roof over them. And that is the um, configuration that we can hope can be worked towards. Next slide. Okay. Now, if the, the uh, eco shading system was possible to be installed and one of, the conf one of the things that Martin brought up is, unfortunately, the eco shades are expensive and this housing is not supposed to be for wealthy people. It's supposed to be for the proletariat. So if it was possible to use a great deal of the eco shading and to therefore buy a lot of it at one time, you'd be able to bring the cost down. If that was possible, they would be powder coated in a sort of a warm metal color uh, not necessarily gold or not necessarily brass or bronze, but probably more like bronze. And if that was the case, at night, when they were illuminated from within or below, you'd see this warm glow. And as Martin said, it's really somewhat similar to the Hawaii, ancient Hawaiian system of using kukui nuts to eliminate, burning kukui nuts to elimin, illuminate the interior of the halepili, the grass houses. Next slide. So, what
what we also see here is these are a, a series of houses that our friends Ron and Larry have designed for the Mamalani Hotel complex. And these very expensive homes were never actually built, but these are the plans that were made for them and the renderings that were made for them. And these are not proletariat housing, but they do incorporate a lot of the, pro the a lot of what we're talking about for the courtyard cabanets. In other words, the, the same basic structure with a space between them that is used for communal living. Of course, these were private homes, but that's, that's what you'd use for your outdoor living, where there also would be, for example, a water feature, a pool, a swimming pool, or just decorative water. Next slide. Now, using that same type of attitude, and again, trying to bring down the cost, because again, these have to be low income, these have to be affordable for people. Martin said, look, if you're telling me this is too expensive, what we need to do is break this down into the components that we would use. And these exploded views show how the same basic components would be reused in the standardized cabana, uh, courtyard cabana uh, subdivision or uh, development if that was built. Next slide. One of the one of the suppliers of this would be the, um, the aggregate company that's here on Oahu. And Martin went out to visit the company and he's had people visit, you know, he's had people, representatives from this company come on the show. And here is the guy from the company on the left looking over the proposal for the construction of these concrete, uh, concrete elements that could be used, manufactured locally and used in, this, in these developments. And Martin said that when this was first proposed, DHHL sort of tried to get him out of the picture as the architect and go directly to the supplier. And he didn't find that to be that offensive because he said, look, that means it's an acknowledgement that this is a successful proposal and that they want to pursue it even further. Next slide. So what are the elements that you can use? And we don't want to necessarily import everything. What was suggested was that we use locally grown woods that are exotic or invasive species, such as eucalyptus, which grows really quickly, and which can be used for other things. Now, the native wood koa is extremely desirable. It's extremely expensive. It obviously cannot be used for mass housing, but it was possible to take this nasty particle board, which is this American invention of wood chips that are encased in a resin that's used for inexpensive, uh, inexpensive things like kitchen cabinets. If it was heat treated, it turns into this other rather elegant looking wood that again is super cheap. It's super kind of nasty when you look at it, but it can, can be treated to make it more robust and it could actually look a great deal nicer. Next slide. Um, so here's an overall view of what might be happening with the courtyard development. And what we see here is, again, you can see all of those are individual shipping containers. Between them, there is the communal open space that is shared by everybody who lives in those. You also see that there's a central roofed court area, and it's where people are living together and using this space together, facing out onto the road. Next slide. And here is an example of that communal open space. Here is how vital it could be. Here is how people could be using it. Here are how the inhabitants of this space are using it communally rather than separate private courtyards. But what we've got is the idealized system. You can see the wall, the wood that I just described to you as, as being used for the exteriors of these. And this is the way that we can think of the use of shipping containers as well as, and this is an international concern of the use of shipping containers, which are all over the world all the time. There are millions of them in transit. What do we do with them when they're no longer in use? Can we re repurpose them to become housing? And is that our last slide? Can I? assume that we are at the end of the program. Again, I apologize for not being prepared for this, but if this is the end of the program, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, Martin, I'm sorry that you weren't able to talk to us. There's Martin, I can see Martin. I don't know if Martin can, can 
actually speak to us or not. But in any case, I hope I managed to carry the ball you know, as, as, as well as I could. Um, we will be seeing you. I won't be on next week's show, but we will be back with more of our courtyard discussions in the near future. And um, until that time, everybody, aloha from Martin, who's silent in Germany, and me in Honolulu. Aloha.